I'm ready. Uh, okay. There you are. So um, there's a, there are two more sets of this. Do you have everything?
by donations from many of you, as well as a wide array of state companies. We'd like to especially thank two sustaining sponsors that provided major support for tonight's event. That's Los Alamos National Laboratory and Intel. We also want to thank our friends at New Mexico PBS and KANW for broadcasting tonight's event. While we hope that you've all already put your cell phones on stun, I will say that this is the opportunity for you to send a quick text to the kids at home or your friends that might not be here with us tonight that they can tune in at NewMexicoFirst.org for a streaming broadcast of tonight's program. It is streaming live, as well as being aired live at 89.1 FM. So let folks know they can listen in if they want. That having said all of that, I'm going to suggest that we get to it. I know many of you are fans of Sam Donaldson, none no more so than the team here at New Mexico First. We all know that Sam traveled the world for ABC News to cover wars and presidents and all manner of major crises for our nation, but tonight he's here in his home state to help all of us talk about how we have a healthier government and a healthier policy process here in New Mexico. I, for one, can't wait to hear what they figure out. Please welcome New Mexico's native son and my friend, Sam Donaldson. Thank you, Heather, how you carry on. It's a pleasure to be here back in my native state. It is the land of enchantment, and I and my wife, Sandy, who's here tonight, uh, enjoy our home in Albuquerque in the state. But enough about us. Heather's uh, capable staff was supported tonight by an excellent program committee chaired by the brilliant Clara Apodaca. Clara, where are you? Clara, stand up, Clara. Shy as always, that's our Clara. And she was helped, of course, by Ian Anderson, Joan Drake, Tom Geraghty, Johnny Montoya, and Jennifer Salisbury. Now, our format, to, our format tonight is uh, rather simple. We'll talk a bit about how to improve the climate of good government, drawing on the experiences of the past year here in New Mexico and in our national legislature. And then we'll take questions from you. And we have some fine students who are volunteers, and they will pass among you in note cards. Have, um, they will give you note cards for you to jot down your question. And importantly, your name. The students will collect your cards, and when the time comes, they'll call on you when I get the cards, and I'll call your name. If you'll come down, there'll be a microphone here, and you can state your question to the panel. So let's get started. The issue at hand is legislative gridlock and how to get rid of it, how to improve the prospect even here in New Mexico. New Mexico First honorary co-chairs, Senators Tom Udall and Martin Heinrich, have some ideas on this subject and they prepared some short videos from us from their Washington offices to jumpstart our conversation. First, let's hear what Tom Udall has to say. Hi everyone, Tom Udall here. I'm so glad to be a part of your program. What an important conversation you're having. Thanks to New Mexico First, to Sam, to your participants, and to Clara Apodaca, a true diplomat who's getting a much deserved Lifetime Achievement Award for making New Mexico a better place. It seems like government gridlock is just part of business now, even here at home. How do we get folks from members of Congress to City Hall to work together? Many of you know this is an issue I care a lot about. The 24-hour news cycle and multi-million dollar campaigns have too many politicians thinking about headlines and donations rather than constituents. I think campaign finance reform could make a big difference. But it's only part of the solution. That's why conversations like this one are so important. We need your ideas. When I think about this issue, I try to look at examples of things that work. One example is at the heart of this organization. Senator Jeff Bingaman and Senator Domenici co-founded New Mexico First. They worked together for decades, getting things done on a bipartisan basis. I try to follow their lead every day in the US Senate. For example, when I introduce a bill, 
I always ask my staff to reach across the aisle for co-sponsors. We get more done by working across party lines, like the Burn Pits Registry, or Katie's Law to help crime victims, or progress on tech transfer. The key is that someone has to take the first step. Bipartisanship should be a verb because it takes action, it takes work. We need to bring policymakers together to work with each other and even more important, to listen. I look forward to hearing more about this discussion. I have a feeling I'll want to bring some of tonight's ideas back to Washington with me. Thank you for coming out tonight. Cheers and have a great program. Thank you, Senator Udall. And now, let's hear from Senator Martin Heinrich and hear what he has to say. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to share a few words at New Mexico First 2015 First Forum Lecture Series. The work that goes into these events to ensure that they are informative and yield productive outcomes is significant. I extend my sincere gratitude to all who made this forum possible and to the founders of this incredible organization, Jeff Bingaman and Pete Domenici. I would especially like to recognize Clara Apodaca, who is being honored this evening. From her service as First Lady, to Secretary of Cultural Affairs, to Senior Advisor to the U.S. Department of Treasury, to the President and CEO of the Hispanic Cultural Center, to her role on the board of Think New Mexico, Clara has devoted her life to our state. Congratulations, Clara, on your Lifetime Achievement Award. I commend all of the community leaders and lawmakers who are also being honored tonight who have proven their ability to put good policy above partisan politics. Thank you for your service. The first forum lecture series gives policymakers and community members a platform to engage with issues most important to New Mexico. The conversations that take place during this forum will help break through the partisanship and gridlock that's become all too common. I'm working in the United States Senate to bring back the spirit of bipartisanship so that we are able to have respectful and frank discussions about the issues that matter most. I was proud to work with my Republican colleague from Arizona, Senator Jeff Flake, to bring more regular bipartisan meetings back to the Senate to foster the kind of productive relationships that are critical for the Congress to yield tangible results for the American people. It is our hope that these meetings will continue to broaden the relationships and deepen the rapport among members, just like these forums do. It is my nature to be optimistic, and I have seen this great nation defy the odds again and again and again. And yes, I believe compromise and even bipartisanship are actually possible. Our country is strong because of rigorous debate, but debate doesn't mean endless gridlock. Despite our differences, there are issues where both parties can come together and find common ground. I will continue to seek pragmatic solutions to help build a future for our nation and New Mexico that all of our children deserve. I'm glad to be a partner in your efforts to do just that. New Mexico First is an outstanding organization, founded and run by outstanding individuals. By engaging on critical issues, you are helping to create change in our communities and build a brighter future for everyone. I'm glad to join my colleague, Senator Tom Udall, as an honorary co-chair of New Mexico First. Thank you again for the opportunity to share a few words with you. Congratulations to all of the awardees tonight, and enjoy the forum. Thank you, Senator Heinrich. So, let's talk about it. Joining me on stage are two Democrats and two Republicans, leaders in our state legislature, together making up four very committed lawmakers. They are, and please join us now, Representative Ken Martinez. Where are you, Representative? Here you come. A Democrat and former Speaker of the New Mexico House. House Minority Leader, Majority Leader, Nate Gentry, a Republican. Senate President Pro Tem, Mary Kay Papin, a Democrat, and Senate Minority Leader Stuart Engel, a Republican. Please join us here. In the <laughs> Please 
Please take your seats. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. You've just completed a special session, very productive, and in any comparison of the way our state legislature has acted over a good number of years with the present partisan, bitter, deadlocked National Congress, hey, we came out on top by a country mile. So I want to make that point right here. We're not trying to compare you with the deadlock in Washington. When the regular session ended, however, Governor Martinez said that the conclusion represented, and I quote her, a gross failure of leadership. The Las Cruces Sun News editorialized that both parties shared in the blame, in their opinion, and they said that many bills fell victim to what they called the partisanship that dominated the session. That's one point of view. But the question I want to ask each of you to begin with, why couldn't you have gotten your important work done in the regular 60-day session? I'm just going to go down the road. Representative Martin. Uh, thank you, Sam, and it's an honor uh, to be here, and especially honoring the honorees. I uh, had been speaker and now have moved to the back row, so part of what occurred in this last session uh, was a little bit out of uh, my control. What I could say is uh, when I was speaker, I tried to get the important stuff done first. So we had done the uh, capital outlay bill and kind of were done with it early, everybody working together. I would suggest that uh, assigning blame isn't important, but learning uh, is. And uh, my uh, opinion has always been nothing succeeds like success. So you start finding out where you agree, and those are your successes that you build upon. If you um, focus on your differences, uh, then you get stuck on those. So we spent probably, I think, too much time on things that we didn't agree upon. Uh, things like uh, the undocumented having driver's licenses, things like abortion. Um, and, and they took up a tremendous amount of time when the things that we do agree upon uh, got a little pushed back from that. Representative, uh, I'm told that you couldn't hear me earlier. You're blessed, you're lucky. <laughs> I didn't have anything important to say. Here we have the important things. Uh, and let's hear now from uh, the House Majority Leader, Nate Gentry. Uh, thank you, Sam. Yeah, I think I agree with uh, Representative Martinez. I mean, I, I think the, the lesson to be learned from uh, this last session was that we need to put in more work earlier. I mean, I know that uh, Chairman Laren Yaga is here, and he did a fantastic job of getting a budget done, uh, getting a budget done quickly. Um, he worked closely with um, Senator John Arthur Smith, and they were successful in getting a budget out which is our number one job. But during the interim, you know, they have the benefit of LFC meeting frequently and beginning the, the process early. Um, so they have a, you know, a mul many months head start on that process. So they do a very good job of determining what needs to be done, um, where the others, the other stand, or the other side stand, and coming to an agreement um, through a collaborative effort. So I think the lesson learned um, from last session, particularly on the capital outlay bill, was that um, we need to begin the process earlier instead of very late in the game and much before, in my mind, the 60-day session. Senator Papin, so far we've heard, I think, if I've heard it correctly, that they just didn't start early enough with important stuff. Is that your view? Uh, Sam, I, yes, I think that is true. I think so often we get caught up with certain bills and that uh, sort of sucks all the air out of the room. And we get so focused on that that our main objective done, it's in our Constitution that we must have a balanced budget and we must do that. So I think that it's, it's important and I think that we did pass a lot of bills, I think over 100 bills that, that we passed unanimously out of both houses. And so I think that also speaks uh, it, it, in good stead for all of us, that we are able to come together and do that. Senator Engel. Well, it's uh, my years there, we've had a similar situations happen before. You know, we can get things done earlier, but the basic, uh, basic way the legislature works is uh, you have things that are very important and they're in one house or another, they're brought forth that way. One house passes them, maybe they're a little bit leery of passing them 
because maybe the other house will hold something in, in ransom. And you always have to remember, too, for the first time in 60 years, since the 1950s, the Republicans had control of the House of Representatives. That's a new, that's a new wave, a new wave there. And uh, the thing about it is, till those things get adjusted, and I think there is some adjustment there this year, but the budget was passed. That's the main thing that we have to pass as legislators. The capital outlay situation changed drastically from July. You had 250, 280 million dollars, perhaps, of capital outlay to fund projects, highway construction, lots of different things like that. By December, we were down to damn near nothing, so to speak. Oil was at $40 a barrel, and it makes a huge difference. So you had a lot of things there that were working in a process on capital outlay and the revenues of the state. So there's always going to be some things that happen like that. There's a tax bill that was brought over. It was on, put on a bill of mine. It was brought back for concurrence. And the Senate didn't hear those bills from the House. It was brought for concurrence, which means you vote up and down. There's no amendments. So very often there's questions on some of those things that are hard to get answered. But basically, there were some disagreements on capital outlay and funding of highway projects, things like that. The thing about it was, was after some discussion, both sides of the aisle, and a uh, few press releases that angered this side, angered that side, we got together around the 20th of May, 25th of May, something like that, John Arthur Smith and I, uh, Nate Gentry is certainly part of it, the speaker's part of it, and basically tried to make sure that we could get this thing through. The governor's office also participated very well. Everybody gave a little bit. Mm. We get up there and get something done in three hours. And that's what it takes to do the things. There's got to be a, a point of agreement, and uh, that's what happens, and that's how it works. You, you set the stage. I want to come to the special session, which was very productive, no question about it. But I want to press one more thing about the general session. Uh, so my home county, I was from Doniana County, newspaper, is wrong. You want to tell this audience there wasn't partisanship, that bills didn't die because of gross partisanship, it was Kim Booyah, it was just a question of scheduling and all that? You've come close to saying no, there were disagreements. Well, of course those things are there. I'd like to hear right? from the others. I carried a right to work bill and it finally got a hearing and it, uh, you know, it went down dead. And, uh, you know, I didn't, wasn't anything I didn't expect. The House passed it. We couldn't pass it in the Senate because the votes were we're not there to do it. All right, you raise a you good You can question. call that partisan if you want Let to. Let me ask the others the about, about this partisanship. I think we want a partisan government in the sense that you we have it. contending views. Absolutely. If we, everyone was agreed, we'd call it, well, I won't use the word national social, but we'd have one party. We don't want one party. But the question was, and we'll come to the special session where you did do a, great, a lot of productive work. During the general session, were you hindered by what this newspaper called excessive partisanship? Say yes or no, or, or yes. I think it was excessively partisan. Uh, it was uh, surprising to me. Uh, I think we spent more time on political questions than we did on performance questions. Why would that be, in your view? Uh, I, I, and I, I don't like to assign blame, but I think there was an exuberance of taking the House for the first time in so many years. Can you blame the Republicans? No, I don't blame them because <laughs> it, you know it's like, oh, we're we're in charge now, and boom, here it comes. But it was really nothing new. It was a bunch of kind of retreaded stuff that was a little bit partisan. I believe that the general public uh, thinks that the best uh, politics is performance. And they want us to por perform well and, and get away from the political fights. There's a, uh, if you ask the average man on the street, red, red, straight, red state, blue state, what do you think about those very hot button, button issues? There's very little difference between Massachusetts and Utah. But if you ask a likely voter in a primary, there's a huge difference. And sometimes we're looking at the likely voters in the primary instead of focusing on what the general public wants. Mr. Gentry, he, he's, Mr. Martinez has confessed to, in his view, excessive partisanship. Wrong? No, I disagree. I, I, the, I'm glad that, <laughs> and he's, that's, that's what you'd expect from a Democrat, Sam. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm glad that Senator Domenici's name was mentioned by, by both Senators Udall and Heinrich. I mean, there's certainly issues that 
Republicans and Democrats are going to disagree about. And, you know, that's the nature of politics. That's the nature of partisan government. And certainly there were those issues. Um, you know, there always have been. There are certain bills that, you know, Republicans have run in the past that have been buried because there's been um, Democrat control of both chambers. So obviously those bills were now coming to the floor and making it over to the Senate. And they didn't get very far. And, uh, you know, that was no surprise, I think, to anybody. But I think there was not, um, there did not become a time um, when there weren't those times that we voted on those issues and then we moved on. And that's something that Senator Domenici was great at. You know, to hear him and Senator Kennedy argue against one another on the floor of the Senate, you know, the other was trying to ruin the country and this is the worst thing ever. But then they would find the thing they could agree on and they would work on those issues and make those issues happen. And I think there were those issues this year, um, as there always happen. All right. Senator Papin, write a reply about the Democrats versus what uh, Mr. Engel said. Uh, I, I think the Senate, uh, you know, we didn't have a change in party leadership in the Senate. We remain the same as we have been for, for a long, long time. And I think that, uh, I think, there were a few issues that did come up that were very partisan, and uh, I think that's the nature of the beast. Uh, but I think in many ways that we were very unified on a lot of things, and I feel very comfortable about that. And I don't think you're going to get away from partisanship uh, when we're talking politics and we're talking passing laws that affect people's lives. I think that's just going to happen. And I think the best way we can do that is if we can come together, if we can sit down and find a common ground, that that's what's important. At this point, I want to shift just slightly to what's happened in our National Congress and ask you whether it happens here and to what extent in New Mexico. Uh, Congress is broken. It's a deadlock, although there's some light now that looks like it's starting to break. Uh, and I've talked to members there who say, Look, I'd like to make a deal. I can't make a deal. I'd be I voted out. All my constituents or the majority of them say to me, oh, you stand fast right there. Do you do not compromise? And I know that the only way to go forward is to make a deal, but I can't do it. Do any of you have that problem with your base? Both sides now have bases that are very committed and feel very strongly. Do they say to you, don't you deal with this other party and you stand fast? And does that get in the way of progress? You know, basically what we are, are as legislators, once you're elected, you need to uh, put a small case on your party affiliation. You're the only lobbyist the average person has in your district. To try to know what they want, and regardless of whether the party's there or not, that's neither here nor there. What your job is to do is the best job you can do for them as their representative or senator. For your schools in the area, the businesses in your area, and the things that are good for New Mexico that we'll all gain from. In my, in my Senate district is, is so spread out all over the place, so much different. I need, only needed 18 signatures when I ran the first time because I didn't have any Republicans. And I was so damn, so damn dumb, I didn't know that. But I knocked doors till I, my head fell off, and I got bit by dogs, and uh, I got just hammered with the doors slamming in my face and in my face. But the thing about it is, that's what we have to remember. Once we're elected, all the partisanship is one thing, but we have to think of how the people in our district feel about us and how what they want us to do. And it's our job to communicate. Yeah, but because we're uh, never Jack, right Let me just time. jump in here. I okay. agree with you. Go ahead. I understand politics. You're the people moderator. People in your district you represent. <laughs> They, our forefathers set it up. They called it not term limits, they called it an election. That's and right. If you want to be reelected, you want to pay attention to that. But if you work hard for your people in this state, you'll have you, this office as long as you want to. Compromise. Stand fast. And if so, do they do it repeatedly? I don't pay attention to that. Wow. I look I at the issue of what's work. good for the state of New Mexico, in my best I, opinion. I'm, not, I'm just teasing. That's what I do. Uh, does anyone else want to weigh in on this business about uh, your party base getting a little really tough and making it hard to make a deal? I, uh, I would say that you're, you hit it 
exactly. A lot of people think it's Republicans versus Democrats. And what's happening is the further right reaches of the Republican Party, saying it in, I, I was talking about Dem, Democrat primaries, re, Republican primaries. Uh, ironically, you hear rumors about there that some of our own honorees are, are going to be primaried for being, uh, working in, in a nonpartisan manner. I like to say nonpartisan other than bipartisan. Uh, and so it takes a certain amount of courage to not only say uh, that I, it doesn't take the courage of working with a Democrat if you're a Republican, it takes the courage of going back home in your primary, which is gonna be a little left or a little right of what the moderate general election looks like. So that's an interesting concept. But I do agree with Stu uh, Engel. Uh, there's a lot of us like him that said we weren't elected to be reelected. Uh, we were elected to serve, and as, and as soon as you say that, it frees you. So this fear of re-election uh, is a, uh, a fear that you lose control over doing the right thing. Yeah. And you have to say, look, I wasn't elected to be re-elected, I was elected to do the best I can for my community while I'm here. And if I'm not re-elected as a result of it, so be it. Anyone else want to weigh in on this one? If you don't want to weigh in, uh, we understand, let's, let's move on. <laughs> well, I'm fascinated by it because we've just seen a couple of examples. President Obama wanted to, he's got it now, trade authority. The Republicans wanted most of them trade authority. And his liberal left base just had a fit uh, when they couldn't throw him out of office and he leaves anyway. Uh, and then Steve Pierce from the great state of New Mexico, he voted for the trade bill and that was against Republican leadership in the House, so he got thrown off as a majority whip, one of the whips. Uh, so that pressure is always there, the reward, the punishment. Let's go to the special session now. You made a deal. How did you make a deal in the special session when you couldn't do it in the regular session? Senator uh, I think, uh, Sam, I think that both sides sat down and there was like 15 of, of the legislators that sat down and worked out things that they felt, we can't live with this, and we can't live with this, so what can we do about it, and how can we not do that? And in the end, I know part of the problem was that uh, in the uh, bill, the nursing homes, uh, I mean, the uh, senior citizen centers were removed, and uh, that was something that the Democrats felt was unacceptable. Uh, the governor uh, wanted some roads, and I think we all wanted roads, but the way the governor wanted to take the dollars to pay for the roads was not something that we felt we could live with. And so we came to an agreement where we split the way she wanted to pay for the roads, the way we wanted to pay for the roads, and did that. And then we were then able to also put the nursing, I'm not, I keep saying nursing homes, the senior centers back in there and our universities we were able to put those back into the bill and then we were able to pass that bill and uh, get out of there in what three and a half hours mr gentry you were a key player how did you do it well yeah i again it, we had a little more time i'd say um you know as, as uh, Stuart said you know after i think there was a um i think there was a lot of disappointment um we're sent there to do a job and we didn't do that job and so I thought everyone recognized that, um, you know, they were, they were not fulfilling their duties to their constituents in their state. And uh, we got, you know, we got back together and, uh, you know, everyone went home with a, with a half a loaf. We were able to spend a little more money out of the general fund. Um, John Arthur Smith and, you know, our speaker were, were key in coming to that agreement. And uh, we were successful at the end of the day. Okay, you did it. But you did it in secret, basically, on the phone, meetings, 15 people, my office, your office, let's get together, what about this, what about that? And you have an open law here in New Mexico, uh, which says the public has a right to be in on the process as it goes forward, not just on a Monday, okay, this is what we've done, we're gonna vote, and let's all go home and the business community is delighted and we have capital outlay and what have you. So I just have to ask you about that because Susan Bow, who is the executive director of the New Mexico Foundation for Open Government, complained and said 
The whole process gave the appearance of government being conducted behind closed doors, which is never good government. Please. Well, I think we have passed uh, an open conference committee bill in New Mexico, and I think and our conference committees are open. And I think that basically this was not a conference committee in, in that respect. I, I know from the Senate Democrats, we wanted John Arthur Smith and the Republicans from the Senate, we wanted Stuart Engel and John Arthur Smith to craft what, and we would stand behind them. Whatever they came up with, we would be supportive Does of. Does anyone think there's a problem with the open uh, government law? I don't have a problem with Open that. meetings? I don't have a problem with it, but we haven't had any conference committee since it was passed. Well, you didn't have, <laughs> well, you didn't have any conference committee because you didn't do it in the regular session. Let's, let's, hey. The thing about it is, you know, the thing about it is, is, is conference committees are conference committees. They say they owe oh, in Washington, they have open conference committees. They do, but they don't. They have an unofficial one first, and then they have the official one. We haven't gotten to the unofficial parts yet. But the thing about it is, and let's, let's not leave out the fourth floor. They were certainly a part of this agreement on this, on this special session and to get some things done. So I don't want to leave the, the governor's office out and, uh, on this at all because there was, there was, a, there was a basically a general attitude here. Let's get this problem solved. Let's go on and get the, poke, get the, the things done for the people in New Mexico. We well, need to everybody was involved. The thing about it is there's sometimes, as you know, you're a newsman. You discuss stories, I'm sure, basically. What can we say about this for sure? Is that public? No, but you're not a governing thing, but there's sometimes things we have to talk about. We just can't say, okay, we're talking about this, and the next thing it's on TV. Well, when you're a representative or a senator and you're in government, when you've talked about it, many people get the idea it's already been voted on and passed. And it's not that they don't care. It just sometimes are portrayed as things that are already done when they're not. Well, someone weigh in on this, too, because you're right. I'm not naive. Uh, often, if you have very delicate negotiations going on, if you have other people kibitzing every five minutes, your base or not your base, the <laughs> reporters, not me, of course. I never did anything like that. You can't do it. You can't do it because you're pushed and pulled. Weigh in on this. Uh, so should we do away with this law? I mean, <laughs> either. I, I think um, the more open government is, the better it performs. It may make things a, a little bit slower, uh, but when you have an open debate with regard to what you're doing, you can avoid problems. And uh, what we try to do, and I, I do uh, thank Speaker Tripp for this, is that we knew that there was a meeting to close the gap, but you understand it was just a gap. We had the bill that came out of the Senate. I think there's only one vote against it. It was changed drastically in the House uh, Ways and Means Committee, it's called now, um, and, and that was towards the end, like the last week. So there's not much time to right the ship and close that gap, so that's why it didn't happen, not assigning blame. So, But the gap being closed, the, this big, huge, year-long task of how do we spend this money has been accomplished and now you have a gap as a result of that change. Folks, smart folks should be in a room trying to figure out how do we close that gap. But the public has a right to know what the gap was and how it's closed, and that was in the committee process. And on the House side, we made sure to convene the committees. Uh, the chairs called the committees and took the bills up to committee and where any member of the public had an opportunity to do it. Uh, it was fast. Uh, three and a half hours, but I think everybody agreed if you're just closing the gap and there's pretty universal agreement, don't spend a lot of taxpayer time on this. Let's get it done. Okay, campaign finance. Let's, oh, this subject is on the table. It's around there like the rattlesnake. Well, let's talk about it. New Mexico is one of only four states that does not require any financial disclosure from non-coordinated political expenditure groups. Why not? What's, what, what's wrong with New Mexico and the other three states? What vision do they see? Why don't we need a tighter campaign finance law? I support disclosure. We've had the bill uh, every year. Uh, Senator Peter Worth has been a champion on it, carrying it. Uh, it's a uh, moving target from the point of view of the law being changed, especially at the national level. 
Um, we voted for it again. I thought we may even get to it this year. No, we never got to the floor. Yes, committees, that's fine. Wonderful. It's, it's a bill like that's passed the Senate and a bill like that's gone through the House to get it to come together. But I, I support it and I think we should have disclosure. Uh, I think there should be disclosure wherever it's possible under the law. Uh, and I think disclosure is actually more important than limits. I think what we've seen is with the limits coming in, the third parties are coming in dropping a ton of money and the candidates have no control over that. I had candidates that were running as Democrats saying they're hitting my opponent we live in the same town, we're friends. Tell them to stop. I said, no one can even talk to them. And that's been a big problem. Mm -hmm. The fact that you have these independent campaigns, which seem to be all negative all the time, with no control by the very people running who would never have a, a part of that. Mr. Gentry, you're the House Majority Leader. Why didn't get to the floor? You know, it's, it's passed, um, you know, even before we took over as, as the majority party, I mean, it, it had come to the House numerous times. I, I'd, I'd seen it every year since I'd been there. You know, I think it's a very difficult, um, it's a very difficult issue. And what I mean by that is it is a moving target. Why is it difficult? Well, because, you know, for several re reasons. You don't want to, you know, limit people's ability to, to um, engage in the political process. So there's also very um, frequently changing law regarding what constitutes a, constitutes an independent expenditure committee. And, you know, there's, uh, there's also the issue of what do, do we need to do? Because as a practical matter, all of the um, independent expenditure committees that are organized in New Mexico are reporting. They're reporting under the Campaign Practices Act. So there is disclosure, um, and I think it just, we just need for to For those committees. For those committees. Not the absolutely. ones I was talking about. Not the ones, which were you talking about? I was talking about the committees that are non-coordinated. Right, the independent expenditure That's committees. right. Yeah, they are reporting under New Mexico law. They are? Yes. I learn something every day, believe me. <laughs> I'm not a fount of all wisdom. Right. But I want to make certain that maybe I have the wrong nomenclature. Maybe I have the wrong words here. I, I think you're correct. Hmm? I, th I think you're correct. There's well, some... Wait a moment. <laughs> if I'm correct, the distinguished majority leader is not. So independent expenditure committee, the super PACs that are state-based yes. that are playing the in state George races. George Soros, the Koch brothers, each one to put in a billion dollars in elections. That's the democracy. The Citizens United says it. The court has ruled. So the ones I'm familiar with, Sam, are were Reform New Mexico Now um, and Patriot Majority Fund on both sides. And those are the state legislative super PACs, independent expenditure committees. And both of those reported under the Campaign Practices Act, just like I report. Then why do I committee. read from, I think, authoritative sources that New Mexico is only one, one of four states that don't do this? With this help me, uh, the other two haven't spoken. Well, I, I think that the public has a right to know. I think the public wants to know. And I think you should be able to give whatever you want to give, or, or, or company, or individual. But I think also that that should be uh, made public. Um, I support let, it. Let, let's hear from Mr. Ingle. Well, I can tell you one thing. In my years in the legislature, Senator. I've never seen anything that be changed overnight as fast as laws on uh, fundraising. Everybody has a way of getting around any law we write. And I don't know how in the world we'll ever write one that does somebody can't get around the darn thing. And the thing of it is, as I've seen it on both sides of the aisle, work very well. And so it works well, so let's not do away with it for, for that. Oh, yeah, let's do it well. We lost two seats on account of that. The thing about it is, Sam, as you know, laws like this and our court system design what really works here, and they haven't ever. You'll find one that agrees with it, another one that doesn't, says, no, they have a right to give all they want to. You can't stop them. You can't write a law that somebody can't get around in some way or another and do something with. And it's fine, you know, back when we didn't have limits and things like that, I think it was a heck of a lot easier to find out who was doing what than it was when we put all these laws in here. Because the thing about it is, we still don't know, and we've got all these damn laws in here, and you still can't find out anything. <laughs> I don't want the and, panel to dissolve into an argument over whether we should have laws or not, or whether 
well, the law is an ass. Is what is, I don't know why I New do Mexico. I don't know why New Mexico hasn't does, but one house will pass it and the other one won't, and that's kind of the way that sometimes works up there. And I can't understand it's it either. Is that his fault? We don't have campaign finance law. Is that your point? The thing of it is, I've never seen it when you couldn't get around it. Well, okay. Some way or another, you've got to. We've got and limits. I jaywalk we've also, but you know now, the point is, it's still get the around box. the limit. Uh, except for one individual in this panel, I take it there is no great urge on the other three's part to have a campaign finance law and join these other states. Am I correct? Come on. Well, the laws thing about laws, it is, is you show me the law that will work. You have to form it. That's your job. Well, show me, show me a law that works. Show me a law that works in another state, and I'll, and I'll draft it. I'll get the darn thing drafted, and we'll try to pass it. I don't have the brilliance to do it, but you guys have been elected to do it. All right, let's move okay, on. Well, you let's show me on. a state that it really works, and I'll, I'll To uh, another we'll non-controversial non, uh, subject, the okay. Ethics Committee. The what? Now, the, and, well, we don't have an Ethics Committee here, so... No, well, we have Ethics members of the Ethics Committee here. Well, now New Mexico is one of only eight states well, Without we probably need to do committee. away with that, too, then, huh? <laughs> you laugh, sir. I'm not <laughs> laughing, but I'm, I'm on the committee, and we had a hell of a decision. This, but are you this telling session. me that New Mexico doesn't need an ethics no, committee? New Mexico had ethics, and we had, a, we, had a, we had that this session in the Senate, sir. Well, but you didn't pass it. Well, we had a senator resign. Excuse me? We had a senator resign. Well, I don't know the case, but I won't, no. therefore, get into it. But one senator resigning, for whatever reason, does not equal an ethics committee that governs all of you in public office. Well, we have an ethics committee, and it does, it does uh, govern us pretty harshly. You do have an ethics committee. Now I have the same situation I had over here. I think you don't have an ethics committee, and you tell me you do have an <laughs> ethics committee. Okay. So we, uh, Senator Papin, do we have an ethics committee? Yes, Sam, we do have one. Anyone think we don't have one? We, we, uh, the question is, uh, should we have an ethics commission? Uh, and we've had that. Well, you're right. I used the word committee, and you were right commission. to seize on my word in the legislature. Yeah, so I am talking about a commission. I see our, our uh, number one advocate for that in the audience, uh, Mary, Mary Helen Garcia, who carried uh, that bill. I've carried it as well. And we did have an ethics commission bill which would go across the board uh, through all uh, branches of government. And it's a little hard to do because is the judiciary separate? How does the executive tie into the legislature? And the uh, constitution of the state says each house shall be the sole judge of its qualifications of its members, which seems to say that the only uh, way to remove a senator or a representative is through that in-house process. So the House has nothing to do with the Senate. The Senate has nothing to do with the House on that. So how does the commission work into that? There's a 30-page bill. Uh, that's an ethics commission that other states have that would have a very fair process. The most important thing to note about an ethics commission is the overwhelming majority of people in government, legislators, representatives, senators, school board members, mayors, city councils, county commissioners are very ethical and they're working very hard to make their state better. Uh, and, you know, and so the, the most important thing an ethics commission could do is make it easier for public servants to know what's the right thing to do because the law is on the books but ethics is kind of a changing uh, dynamic. I mean, I, we were told early on that you probably don't want to use state resources to do your email. Uh, so people go, well, we'll just go to Gmail. And then we're told later on, you shouldn't be at Gmail. You should only be using the state one, which says, well, if I was going to do my... Well, so, so there's some moving targets out there that an ethics commission would give the ability for any public servant on that to say, look, what's the best way for me to ha handle my email? Uh, what's, what's the best way? Uh, my kids asked me to sell raffle tickets for the church bazaar. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? So questions like that, that a commission would be able to tell a member, this is how we would avoid it, or if you do it this way, we think it's right, and that kind of gives you a green light to proceed ethically, because I think the overwhelming majority, 99.9%, .9 want to do everything ethically, and we just want to make sure we do it You've made that right. point twice now, and I agree with you, and I want to ask the panel about that. The vast majority of members of the legislature in Washington of 53 years that I knew 
I think were ethical. They were, yeah, the bad apples, but there is in my business too. Why does the public then, so much of the public, according to the polls, think you're all a bunch of crooks? Is it because Mr. Limbaugh and Mr. Savage and Mr. Shanity tell them every day that you're all a bunch of crooks, or why? Seriously, it's a serious question. It, I think, you know, I think the public does, uh, on a, on a large basis, look at those of us who are in these positions as, uh, for some reason, what, what, what is their dark side? And I don't know why they do that, except that they aren't maybe as much a part of the process uh, as they might be, and maybe would understand things somewhat better. And I think we have to do campaign reporting, and we have to report everything. And it goes to the Secretary of State, and, they, and the Secretary of State looks at the thing that our reports that we hand in, goes through them very thoroughly. If there's something there that's disallowed, they certainly let you know about it. Well, we're going to move now to the audience. You all have had enough of me. Let, let's hear <laughs> questions from other New Mexicans. Uh, and uh, these questions were just handed to me willy-nilly. Uh, the question is on the other side. Okay. Uh, Gabriella and J.T. Bullington, are you here? I'm here, right there. Please come forward and uh, state your question. We have a microphone here that... So I'm going to bring it to J.D. because I know where he's sitting, but the folks in the house have actually asked us to ask folks to come forward because they don't want us passing their mic all around. So if you don't mind, if when he calls your name, if you handed a card up, just meet me up here in the corner if that's okay. Uh, yeah, my, my question would go to uh, Representative Kenny Martinez and others on the panel uh, to the primary issue that you raised. And so the question is, I think a lot of people have this question on their mind, would open primaries in New Mexico address some of the issues that you addressed in your comments? Yes. <laughs> yes. Would you, anyone else like to elaborate on that? Kenny open said, primaries? That's, Kenny said yes. Wait, you all for open primaries? I've been primaried before. Open primaries. Everyone gets to vote. Democrats, uh, I Republicans, th I like mugwumps. I think open primaries. I think then everybody gets to vote on everybody who's going to be a representative of the people of the, of the district. But if you have a political party, doesn't that party have the right to select its nominee? Or should people in another party come in and help it select its nominee? It's, well, um, I, I, th I think it's a, a more democratic process. Anybody else weigh in on this? I have a problem with it. I, re I live right next to the state that does it, Texas. I, I, will, I want to add that it's just not Democrat or Republican. It's declined to states or the independents. Mm -hmm. And most of our right. young people are not registering as Democrat or That's Republican. Correct. They feel they don't uh, relate to them, and I get it. Uh, and when you say to the young people, you don't get to vote in the primary, um, and sometimes that's the whole game. Right. Uh, we do redistricting every year, and I can tell you that it's 30 Republican districts, uh, 30 Democrat districts pretty much always, and 10 swings. So if you're not in those 30 and 30, if you wanted to make a difference, you have to be in the primary to do it. And I think by not having an open primary, we're not allowing the young people who have decided that they are independents or declined to states, uh, have an opportunity to vote in a primary where that's the only race that's going to be, it'll be decided in the primary, so well, I think open I'm primaries. I'm going to have one more crack at this apple, just as a devil's advocate. Young people, you're quite right. It may be a way to get them interested in politics. Why would they vote for someone then? Do they understand the different principles of the parties? Do they understand the different positions of the parties? Or do they like, hey, this handsome guy, or I love this? Why would they vote, and what would their vote mean if they're not voting for the principles and the programs that a particular party, as espoused by the candidate, publicizes? They, they'd, be, they'd be voting uh, for the candidate, and you know, we're talking now they'd about... They'd be voting for the person, ad hominem and, vote. And, and, and it'd be uh, the millennials now have a very interesting politics to them because um, they fit the mold mold of Democrats and Republicans a lot. They want government out of their lives, but where government can help people who need it most, they certainly think government should be there. Support schools, funding for education. Uh, should government doing, be doing gun control? Should government be doing stuff with regard to 
um, taking away marriage equality? Absolutely not. So they're an interesting new group that have an interesting new thought process, and they need to definitely be included. Okay. All right, let's go back to the audience. Kent Cravens. Hey, Kent. Kent Cravens, I'll here? meet you in this corner. How about that? Good evening, uh, Sam, thank you, and uh, members, appreciate you being here. Uh, my question deals with economic development and maybe some of your perspective, and I'll just throw it out to anybody who would like to, to visit on that. Uh, your perspective on, a, on some bipartisan approaches, are we ever gonna get right to work, and would it matter if we did? Uh, just let's, let's hear a little, a little thoughts on that. It's a hot issue, who wants to start? Well, I'll start on, on uh, right to work as an issue Maybe it will, uh, anything we can do with the surrounding states that surround New Mexico, they all have it. We need to have that as something that is an attractive thing to business. It doesn't stop unions. It just says who collects the dues. That's all it is. That's all right to work really is is it says who collects the dues. And the thing about it is, if, it'll help us, a lot of if it will help us recruit some businesses in this state, great, because I think it will. We also need to make some changes sometimes in uh, uh, some of our liability laws. What do you mean it all depends on who collects the dues? Right well, to work says that do not have to you don't have join to join a union. That's right. You don't to have to join. Of course, that's that's job. that's elementary part of it. Is you don't have to join a union. Okay, that's right. Isn't that the basis? Yeah. Well, that's part of it, but it also says who collects the dues. You don't well, have to join. You don't have to join a union now, but you won't get the job. Who would collect the dues if there's no union that you're required to join? Who well, would collect the dues? if I was if I liked what the union was doing for me, I'd pay my dues. To whom? To the union. Right, but if you don't have to belong to a union, who gets those dues? You don't well, pay the them. thing about it is, if you if you don't uh, if you don't want to belong, you don't have to pay the dues. But the thing about it That's is, right. so the no thing about the it dues. is, you can't get a job unless you join the union in New Mexico. But in right to work states, you can get a job without right. joining a union. That's right. So you're not paying dues to anyone, are you? Well, you shouldn't be if you don't want to. <laughs> you win. You win. Anyone else on the right to work issue? Uh, not on the right to work issue, but thanks for the question, Kent. Uh, you know, just well, I wanted to commend, uh, you know, Senator uh, Mary Kay Papin and, and Representative Martinez for their work on the Jobs Council. And that's a great example of, um, you know, getting together and, and having meetings frequently during the interim and figuring out what it is that we can do to grow jobs in the state and improve the economy. Um, one thing that I think we really need to look at in New Mexico is, is the tax structure. You know, we have a relatively high gross receipts tax. We offer, um, I think, $3 billion in credits, exemptions, um, you know, other tax incentives that we really have created a um, really Swiss cheese approach to tax policy. Um, and so in order to make up for all those, you know, deductions, credits, exemptions, um, we do have a relatively high GRT rate. So one of the things that I think we need to look at is, you know, are these, um, are these exemptions and credits actually performing like we'd hope they do? They, they are, and if they're not, then, um, you know, remove them and uh, reduce overall the GRT. Because in comparison to our neighboring states, we do have a, a high tax rate. We do. And what about, what about right to work? I, uh, so we, I, I'm glad uh, Representative Gentry, uh, Leader Gentry brought that up. First of all, thanks Kent and, and talk about uh, some nonpartisan work. Uh, Senator Cravens and I carried all the DWI legislation when we were there together and we were able to move pretty big uh, on doing some things that at first New Mexico was like, what are you guys doing? Ignition interlocks and now it's become uh, a model for other states and we moved from uh, number one in DWI deaths, touched your family more than anyone. Uh, and we were able to move our, our state down. And it's one of those things you continuously work on. But Kent, I, I'll never forget uh, arguing on the floor of the House with you standing next to me. So thank you for that. Uh, on, the, on the Jobs Council, my, 
wonderful uh, co-leader there, uh, Mary Kay Papin. We had gone through a cycle of knocking on doors. Most important thing was jobs. Imagine that discussion at a kitchen table when there's no job, can't pay the mortgage. We had to hire more judges, not to deal with crime, but to deal with foreclosures. So jobs are all important. Uh, and I thought that there had been this long debate between economic development and school children, so you would do that, you're taking one from the other, but uh, teaching children is part of economic development uh, because you're creating the workforce, number one. So we got rid of that question. The government being involved in jobs, it always says, well, government doesn't do jobs, they do. We got rid of that question, so what was pork barrels now rebranded as jobs, so we understand that. But the last divide was this divide between industry and labor, which is div divisive and dangerous. Um, and I invited labor and industry and the politicians to be on the same table, and we did it at the Carpenters Hall. And the first question was right to work, and the two top economists in the state said, it's not true, right to work does not create jobs. It does create a divisive divide, and it does suck the air out of the room. And we spent many days on right to work, but all the studies show that it's not a job creator. Okay. So we're better off to have, we're better off to have our brothers in labor at the same table with our brothers in industry asking companies to come in instead of dividing them. Okay, let's move on from here, but let me just restate the question and then we'll move on. Hey, can hey we Sam, ever, just a heads up. I think this is gonna have to be our last one so we can get to our awardees. Can we ever get to right to work in this state Yes or no? Yes? Can we ever get it passed? Can we ever get it? Yes. Well, in my no, years... Quickly, quickly, sir. Okay. We passed it several times in the legislature and never had the governor to sign it. Senator? So if we have, we have one up there now, who knows? I think we probably could get it passed. I don't know that it would pass with an overwhelming majority, but I think it could be passed. Yes. Yes. Yes? No, and it's a, it's a dangerous distraction. Okay. Thank you. Wayne, John, do we have time for one more? I, okay, well, I, here's what I'm gonna suggest. Let's take one more, but I'm gonna ask our panelists, brilliant that you all are, you have a lot to say. I'm gonna suggest that we answer this one really quickly, and then this will be our last question, we'll get to awardees. And then a lot of you, bless you, have provided additional questions. My suggestion okay. for handling some of the additional ones is that we send it to these fine lawmakers, and if any of them have any time or opportunity to provide us some additional opportunities, we'll, additional questions, we'll post them on our blog and submit information back to anyone who's interested right. that way. Mr. Johnson, I'm going to pass over you because your question requires debate and discussion. Let me, let me take a quicker question. Grant Taylor. Grant Taylor, are you here? If you'd state your question, sir, and, and if we could limit the... Uh, Good evening. What is or are the disadvantage or disadvantages of legislative term limits? And what is the chance of legislators uh, passing a bill that would limit their own time in office? <clears throat> Go right ahead down the line, please. So quickly, I uh, quickly. was uh, a, a member of the State Legislative Leaders Conference, so I met with all the leaders of all the different states. The states that had passed term limits uh, were, were sorry that they had because you lose guys like John Arthur Smith or Larry Ladanyago who bring that knowledge to the table that you would not otherwise have, and that knowledge of power moves from the legislative elected members to staff, which isn't always bad, but staff's not standing for re-election. Uh, so I, I, I don't support term limits. I think the most important term limit is the re-election, and if a legislator has not done a good job, they have to go in front of their public, and then the public decides whether or not that legislative is term limited. Yes. I, you know, I, I'm of two minds on it. I, I agree with Representative Martinez. I mean, you do potentially lose a lot of institutional knowledge, but, you know, there are those politicians that, you know, the number one job is getting reelected. And if they have, uh, if they have the notion that their term's going to come to an end, why not do the things you've wanted to do? And so I think that uh, there is benefit it, in that. You know, go ahead. Excuse me. I, I agree. I think that the election is the term limiting. If you don't like someone that, that is representing you and they're not representing you properly or the way you would like to have them represent, vote against them. And I think that is the way to do your term limits. It takes, it takes uh, six to eight years in the legislature 
to really get to know people in government, get to know people at public institutions, get them to know you. Because this can be a really, really cutthroat world. And people do not reveal things to legislatures, legislators until they trust them. And you can have people in the bureaucracy that can tell you things that are happening and how to fix it before something horrible happens. But if you have this constant change, nobody really knows anybody. And it doesn't, in the states that have done it, they have had some real, real bad foul ups. Well, as, as and you it know. just simply does, it's not, it, it sounds great, but it simply won't work. Well, it, as you know, it didn't sound great to the founding fathers. They debated in the Constitutional Convention whether to put in term limits, and they concluded, as you have concluded, that they would. It would be called an election. So that if we don't like what you do, we throw the bombs out. The great battle cry of American politics. Well, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much thank you. for this panel. We Now to the awards for tonight. Tonight we applaud five individuals for their dedication to working in the spirit of bipartisanship. New Mexico First Board Member Gene Baca will tell us how tonight's honorees were selected. Gene. Hello everybody, I'm glad to be here with you tonight. And I really enjoyed this, and, and I mean, those are some hard questions. Please don't ask me any questions here because I don't think I can answer them. <laughs> but I, I have to say that I have worked with every one of these, uh, these public servants here, and they do an incredible job. Ethical, hardworking, they do it for free, and they really do what they think is best for New Mexico. And so I just want to applaud them for what they've done and for coming out here for us. <laughs> but I do appreciate the questions, Sam. Those are great. So partisanship, we hear a lot about that these days. And even though uh, we may think it's a recent phenomenon, it really isn't. Partisanship uh, and bitter partisanship arose with the birth of our country. And George Washington warned of the danger of excessive partisanship and the effect on our liberty and counseled that the check is public vigilance and public opinion. And I thought about that as they were speaking up here. I mean, really, that is the check for partisanship. If we don't like it, vote them out. If we don't like it, then raise a stink about it. So, but the other, on the other hand, though, there are those, and there are many here in the audience who we've awarded before, uh, who are collaborative and who do try to find common ground and who really do try to act in a bipartisan way. And tonight, we are, we are recognizing those people who have the courage and the fortitude to do that against partisan politics. And yeah, they face their, their, their primary and, and they, they gotta go back and look at the, the extremists on their, each party, but they go out and they do the right thing and they try to find a solution that works for New Mexico. And we gotta, we gotta applaud those people. So our committee was tasked with selecting award recipients who lead, govern, and administer through consensus building and collaboration. And there are a lot of impressive, we had a lot of, of applicants or a lot of uh, nominations here. And the awardees here with us tonight demonstrate the continued commitment to putting ideology and partisanship aside and moving New Mexico forward. And we have a great group of recipients tonight. So these values have always been the cornerstone of New Mexico First's mission. And it's important that we recognize individuals who share the same values. So we'll get on to the awards here. But I'd like to recognize first our award selection committee members. And uh, can we please recognize Janet Green, Cynthia Nava, Clint Harden, Leanne Kravitz, and Heather Ballas. And thank you very much for your hard work. Your 
supposed to clap a little bit longer so I can make it back. <laughs> but anyway, um, so New Mexico First tradition is to, is to present each awardee with an Indian wedding vase. This is an Indian wedding vase, and, and many of you have heard the story before. If you've been here before, you've heard it, and many of you are familiar with it. But uh, just as the base symbolizes the bringing together of two families in a marriage, we use it tonight to symbolize the bringing together of the two parties. And the vases are fragile, and so this year we're sending them home wrapped. And so, but they're but they're beautiful, and I think that it is it's you know quite quite a statement with these vases. So uh, New Mexico First is proud to honor the five awardees: they're Democrats, they're Republicans, and Independents who all show collaborative leadership in various sectors. So we'll get on to the awards, but thank you all for all that you do. And, and for those who are in the audience here, there's several who have received this award. Could you quick, quickly stand up? Because many of you have received the Bipartisanship Award. And I know that I've seen several of you in the audience. <laughs> With that, I'll turn it back to Sam. Thank you. Thank you, Gene. Presenting our first award in statewide leadership is Carol Leach of Concho Resources. Concho is a sponsor of tonight's event. Carol? Have you ever known any person who's responded poorly in a crisis situation? They run around, they act like a chicken with their head cut off, they point fingers and blame everybody, and they accomplish nothing except creating more chaos. Well, now imagine the polar opposite. What would that be like? In this case, it would be someone who's calm, reasoned, not ruffled, steady, a problem solver. That's David Abbey, and that's, I'm honored to present him as a award tonight. <laughs> David has worked for the people of New Mexico for about 30 years. For most of the last two decades, David has directed the state's Legislative Finance Committee, simply known as the LFC. David leads a staff of 38 analysts, economists, editors, accountants, and others who have the huge job of drafting the state's budget every year. That budget includes education, health care, economic development, environment, energy, and anything else you can name. The LFC staff also predict the future revenues in order to create a balanced budget. Then they monitor program implementation by the state agencies. To do this job, David, an economist by training, works with community members, government employees, and elected lawmakers of both parties. He takes particular pride in his years of collaborative work on early childhood education, leading to the appropriations for a full day kindergartens, K3, K2, K3 3 plus, and early childhood accountability. He's also devoted years to the public school capital outlay council, which has substantially rebuilt schools throughout the state. The emphasis on kids and education are also hallmarks of his personal life. Most recently, David helped lawmakers find common ground to allow for the successful special session and the passing of the nearly $300 million capital outlay bill that will benefit the economy of New Mexico. These are just a few of dozens of examples. The bottom line is David is a man who does not identify legislators as Republicans or Democrats. To him, they are all lawmakers who represent the people around the state who elected them. David works with them in a creative and a collaborative manner to produce a budget that adequately meets the needs of the state and fits within the anticipated revenue. It's a tough job, and he does it, and he'll do it again every year. Please join me in congratulating a true champion for New Mexico, David Abbey. Representative Call would say when you're working on the budget, when no one could stand it, it was just terrible, he'd say, you know you were done. So my goal every year is to try to get the budget passed unanimously. And, it's, and I've heard Pollyannish as we've gone to other states and talked that way, but 
in fact, that's the reality of New Mexico. We've been able to get there multiple times on both capital outlay budgets and general appropriation acts. I, I got to say, too, what, what makes it come together that way, part of it is you never stop. I have key leaders, Senator Ingle was one this year, call often, is what have you done today to make this work? Never, you never stop, and that, that's kind of a key to this. Um, I'd like to thank my staff and my family, who would certainly disagree with the view that I perform my work with calm. <laughs> but thank my wife, Lauren Aramusby Abbey, my son's here, and, and my, I've got a lot of staff here. They make it work for me and for the committee. And then I just want to, I've been really extremely privileged to work for some outstanding volunteer lawmakers. And they, I, I'm going to name a few at risk of not naming enough, but Senator Altamirano, performing work with integrity, great leadership, Representative Saavedra, Senator Beffert, and Larry Yaga, and Smith, and Representative Bratton. So I, I want to acknowledge them and thank you for this award. Thank you, David. Now I'd like to welcome Michael Weinberg to present our next award in statewide leadership. Michael is representing the Thornburg Foundation. Michael. Thank you, Mr. Donaldson. Call me Sam. Sam. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't dare not call you Sam after that panel. <laughs> um, but, uh, whiskey's for drinking, but water's for fighting over. At the Thornburg Foundation, we've taken on some tough issues, we think, and uh, tried pretty hard not to do it in a, in a fighting kind of way. And uh, tonight, I'm, I'm really honored to be able to present this award to someone who has taught all of us how to get right into the middle of some of the toughest conflicts and come out with peaceful agreements. Former state engineer John D'Antonio has brokered some of the most challenging water right agreements in American history. A native New Mexican, John managed water policy for three pretty distinctly different governors, Gary Johnson, Bill Richardson, and Susanna Martinez. History will record three groundbreaking tribal settlements during those years. The first was the Amet Settlement, which resolved the water rights of Nambe, Tosuke, Powake and San Ildefonso Pueblos. Next came the Navajo Nation settlement of the uh, San Juan Basin, which paved the way for a billion dollar infrastructure project. And finally, the Taos Pueblo settlement resolved water rights in northern New Mexico. John also helped negotiate the Colorado River Basin settlements, allowing for equalization of water from Lakes Powell and Mead with our neighbors, including Colorado, Arizona, and Utah. These settlements went beyond bipartisanship, requiring roll-up-your-sleeves collaboration across multiple tribal nations, different states, Congress, and more. Currently, John spearheads water and infrastructure projects for the US Army Corps of Engineers, and he chairs the implementation team for New Mexico First statewide water town hall. Thank you, John D'Antonio, for your courage in the face of conflict, strengthening our desert state's ability to thrive into the future. Good, good evening, everybody. I, uh, it's fitting, I think, that I followed David Abbey for 10 years uh, as part of the executive office. I had to go in front of David and, and, and beg for money for, <laughs> for water issues. And I, I can say David was truly, uh, truly a steward of, uh, of New Mexico taxpayers' dollars. It's, uh, it's a great, uh, great inspiration to all of us. Uh, I want to thank New Mexico First uh, Town Hall for recognizing the importance of water and putting it on their agenda. Uh, New Mexico water is arguably the most important resource that we have within the state of New Mexico. My brother might disagree and say oil and gas is, but... Uh, um, it's going to change at some point. Um, you know, in New Mexico, uh, mi casa es su casa, pero mi agua es mi agua. And, 
and it's that way. Diversity of water uses uh, is, uh, is uh, paramount. You know, you've got the, uh, the municipal uh, uses, you've got the farmers uh, everywhere, the senior water users and the Native Americans and the acequia users, you've got the environmental uses. Everybody is a stakeholder out there in water and all that has to funnel through a process and a bipartisan process uh, that we call state government. We've got some very talented uh, state uh, reps and senators that, uh, that we have to work with over the years. And, and really it's all about inclusive, collaborative solutions, about making really uh, incremental progress is a lot of progress in, in the legislative uh, bodies and, and, and how we do things. Just a little bit of a story, domestic well reform, one of the first years I was state engineer, uh, what a battle, uh, what gridlock did we have? We almost got the, a bill passed, it was uh, on, a, on the last Saturday, right before noon, and uh, we ran out of time, and uh, I had no timeouts left to stop the clock, and uh, it got filibustered. But the point is, is that the discussion, the, uh, the stakeholders met, it formed the boundary conditions for what proved to be a very uh, good law that was promulgated and rules and regulations that were promulgated all in an open process. And that's part of government. It's good government. It, it, a bill doesn't necessarily have to pass, but it, what it does, it lays the foundation for, for really good rules and regulations that can be implemented. Uh, the New Mexico First process uh, can greatly help in that regard. I'm really excited to, to be part of New Mexico First. We have another legislative session in which we can try to get some things done. Uh, I want to thank you all for the award. Uh, I'm really honored. I look forward to uh, continue moving New Mexico forward and making New Mexico first in, in, in more things than, uh, than we have now, obviously. And I would like to thank, uh, so David Abbey, you know, he thanked his wife. I'd be remiss by not thanking my wife, who's my, uh, uh, who's my backbone and uh, supporter of everything I do and all the time that I volunteer, she's always there for me. So thank you very much, I really appreciate the honor. Next, I'd like to welcome Kirby Jefferson to present our next award in statewide leadership. Kirby is Intel's vice president, though this native New Mexican is soon to retire after 35 years with the company. Thank you for your service, Kirby. Thank you, Sam. I'm here tonight to honor a champion for government transparency. New Mexico Senator Sa Sandra Rue has worked across party lines steadily introducing a series of bills to hold public officials accountable and give the public greater access to information. The Sunshine Portal Act, which passed the House and Senate in 2010 with only a single dissenting vote, was among the most bipartisan efforts in the state's history. In 2015, additional legislation passed which requires state contracts to be displayed online in the Sunshine Portal. This bill, co-sponsored with Representative Stephanie Garcia Richards, also garnered excellent bipartisan support. Another 2015 bill increased transparency by hospitals to post information on the Sunshine Portal about the cost for procedures and the quality of care. In the spirit of collaboration, Senator Rue partnered with New Mexico Legislature Jerry Ortiz y Pino and Mark Moores to jointly sponsor the legislation. The panel tonight discussed public trust in government. All of these policies advance that goal and in a sensible and nonpartisan manner. Please join me in congratulating Senator Sander Rue. Thank you very much, and I'd like to uh, thank New Mexico first for this great honor. And it's an honor in and of itself to stand here in the company and be recognized with John, David, Sharon, and uh, former First Lady Claire Apodaca. Again, I have a tremendous amount of respect and admiration for those folks. You know, I think it's safe to say that there are some folks that are confused and even troubled by bipartisanship. Uh, the great sage and philosopher of my youth, George Carlin, once said, bipartisan usually means larger than usual deception is being carried out. Um, a guy on the street once was asked about bipartisanship and he said, sure, I know what that is. Bipartisan consensus is when my doctor and my lawyer agree with my wife that I need help. <laughs> um, 
But on a more serious note, I, I think a former U.S. Cabinet Secretary, which I know Sam knew very well personally, had it right when he said bipartisanship helps to avoid extremes and imbalances. It causes compromises and accommodations. So let's cooperate. And to that, I would simply add that compromise achieved through communicating and listening to the other side of issues uh, is essentially the lifeblood of democracy. And finally, I would like to uh, recognize and thank my wife, Wendy, whose support and many, many sacrifices through the years have allowed me the honor and the privilege to serve in the New Mexico State Senate. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Wendy. Next, I'd like to wear, welcome Carol Rutten to present our Up and Comer Award. Now, this honor goes to lawmakers in the first two terms in office who demonstrate promise as bipartisan leaders. Carol represents Los Alamos National Laboratory. Carol? Thank you, Sam. Well, we are honoring New Mexico State Representative Sharon Klosh Chichilich as an up-and-comer in the New Mexico State Legislature. She is no, new, no newcomer to bipartisan public policy. In her nearly 35 years with Navajo Nation leadership, she fostered collaboration with both parties as well as among the many tribes and pueblos within New Mexico's borders. In her short term in office, she has already proven to be an effective advocate for child safety as well as rural tribal infrastructure. But the activity that resulted in her nomination for tonight's award was the New Mexico Gaming Compact. This bill, which had been introduced in prior sessions, finally passed this year. The passage was due in part to the representatives being able to bring together Democrats and Republicans, as well as a vast majority of, Nat of New Mexico's 23 Native American tribes, nations, and pueblos. In particular, in particular Representative Klaus Chichilich worked closely with the Navajo Nation, the Hickory Apache Nation, the Mescalero Apache Nation, the Pueblo of Acoma, and the Pueblo of Jemez to accomplish a beneficial compact for all parties. Please join me in congratulating Representative Klaus Chichilich. Good evening, and thank you for that beautiful introduction. I like that person. <laughs> I want to thank, I want to be, I, I want to thank all of you for being here. I feel like you're all supporting me. And I want to thank New Mexico First. This is indeed a recognition that I will honor because I am a freshman. Uh, no, I've graduated. I am a sophomore. And I am on my way up to working my way through. Um, I, want, I want to share with you that my success is based on one very um, strong factor of my life, and that is that I am a former special education teacher of behavior disordered category. <laughs> Take that. There are times when I feel like I'm still in the classroom, and my job. <laughs> So I feel like a lot of my basis came from this. Um, I come from a very political family. From as far back as I can remember, I've listened to the stories of how to in politics. And so now that I'm there, I think one of the successes is recognizing who I am, accepting that I am a politician, not a crook, and I love politics. And you have to in order to be effective. Looking at legislation, and we're talking about the gaming legislation, the success in pulling that through was looking at 
whether or not the mechanism was in place to get this piece of legislation through. And, if it, and the pieces that were necessary is what we had to work on. And it entailed coordinating, working with everyone's agenda and having to swallow periodically my own agenda, my beliefs, and having to retailor it according to what would fit for the best of everybody. So I, I just want to thank you all and thank you for recognizing the effort. I think you made a good choice. <laughs> And I will remember this. I mean, this is something I will not take carelessly, handle carelessly. Also, I think a lot of my success also goes back to the kind of people I associate with. I, I'm in good company being on this stage, and I'm so happy to be on the same stage of Clara Apodaca. She is an example of bipartisanship. I watched her with my family, with my uncle, my aunt, when my uncle was in, was the Navajo Nation chairman. And I watched Clara and I watched Jerry Alpadaka as they worked through a lot of the issues with Navajo. I look at my dear friend, Mary Helen Garcia, another role model for me. I look at how she so gracefully and so beautifully modeled bipartisanship. I, I look at Larry Ladniaga, same thing. Plus, he comes from a beautiful family of men. I just want you all to know that. <laughs> and he's one of them. He's one of them. So, so there are many. I look at John Arthur Smith, another example of a man who models bipartisanship. So I'm in good company. So I'm still learning, and I have many beautiful people to learn further from. And again, thank you so much. And you have a nice evening. My husband is here, and I want to thank him, too, for supporting me through thick and thin. Thank you. That's terrific. Now, for our last award, my fellow board member, Joan Drake. This is the culminating honor of the evening, the Lifetime Achievement Award. Joan Drake is an attorney at the Modril Sperling Law Firm, and tomorrow becomes New Mexico First's board chair. Hey, Joan, tell us about our awardee. Thank you, Sam. As many of you know, our own charming and beautiful and glamorous uh, and outgoing Clara Apodaca is our Lifetime Achievement Award recipient this year. This former First Lady with boundless energy is perhaps best recognized as an advocate for the arts, an issue that brings people together across political parties, cultures, and ages. She's also a former cabinet secretary, Clinton-era Washingtonian, and fearless fundraiser, as many of us know, for the many causes she champions. In addition, she is the former president of the National Hispanic Cultural Center Foundation, the creation of this center where tonight we stand is widely considered a triumph in bipartisan action that required federal, state, and private sector collaboration. And as a matter of fact, the two founding board members, Republican Ed Lujan and Democrat Ed Romero, previously received New Mexico First Bipartisanship Award for getting this center off the ground. Clara also serves on the bipartisan boards of both Think New Mexico and New Mexico First. She even agreed months before being selected for this award to chair the program committee for tonight's event, 
honoring bipartisanship. And we thank you for that, Claire. But every one of those activities offers examples of Clara's collaborative and creative leadership, and we've heard, heard a lot about that this evening. But we also want to offer one quick story that you may not know. When the world-renowned Georgia O'Keeffe died in 1986, it was determined that her estate owed money to New Mexico. Clara saw an unexpected opportunity to help a grieving family and create a legacy for our state. She contacted political leaders of both parties and multiple agencies, urging that the estate be allowed to pay its debt in paintings rather than in cash. The result of that is that New Mexico's museums and Capitol and other state buildings are home to several priceless pieces of O'Keeffe art that without Clara would now be spread far and wide away from the land of enchantment. There are lots more stories we could tell, each one of us, but we'll have to stop there. Please join me in honoring the rich and vibrant lifetime achievement of our friend and role model, Clara Apodaca. That's wonderful. Well, first, thank you so much. I'm not going to let you keep clapping like David Letterman does. <laughs> Thank you so much, and thank you for that very gracious introduction, Joan. Honorable legislators, family and friends, ladies and gentlemen, I'm incredibly humbled and honored to be standing here receiving the uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. Never, never in my lifetime I thought I would do that. But I've been a member of New Mexico First for three years now, and I see the work that has gone in, in this organization. And the things that, in all 32 other board members are ex exceptional board members. So I'm not the only one, but the board members are throughout the, the state of New Mexico, so I thank them. I thank the selection committee, uh, chaired by Janet Green and, and Jean Baca, for selecting me. I think that was wonderful. I have a lady and a friend here in the audience that came from Santa Fe tonight. Carol Robertson Lopez, where are you? Yeah. Anyway, she nominated me, and I didn't even know. Carol is the president of the International Women's Forum, and I thank you for that, Carol. Uh, but you know, we couldn't. We, New Mexico First couldn't achieve what we do without the leadership of our president, Heather Ballas. Let's give Heather and our staff a wonderful round. Of thank you. And my family, my five children, my ten grandchildren. And tonight with me is my daughter and uh, son-in-law, Carol and Dr. Jay Folkman. I don't know where you are. And, uh, and my son and daughter-in-law, Jeff and Jackie Apodaca. Thank you. And my other close family, of course, is my sister, Esther Marcus. And she's in the audience. She goes everywhere with me. I've even been, she's been my, we were young girls starting out in a farming small farming community in Donia for being here. Yeah. And the reason I mention all these people, because you know, it takes a village to do anything. And so many of you in this hall and so many throughout the country have been my mentors and have helped me. And I'm really, I couldn't have done it without a lot of you. A lot of you have, you've given me strength, my encouragement, the support, you've given me guidance, advice, uh, mentors, vision, and yes, even fundraisers. And for that, I accept this award on behalf of all of you so much. God bless you. Thank you, Joan and Clara, for a lovely final presentation. Thank you, Sam, for such a thoughtful discussion tonight. We're very, very grateful. 
Thanks to all of the speakers and awardees who commit your careers to the betterment of New Mexico. We know that there are lots of people in the state who are working every single day to put New Mexico first, and we're very, very grateful to you. Um, I would like to remind you, should you want to relive this evening, you will have the opportunity. NewMexicoFirst.org will have live stream of all of it, or um, a videotape of all of it, um, posted, we think, by tomorrow, no later than Monday. And then the last thing I just want to say to all of you is in the coming months, if you would please take tonight's messages to heart and join us in being evangelists for a healthy, engaged democracy, please be safe going home. Thank you for sharing your evening. Good night. Can I have the awardees up front for a picture, please? <laughs>